كسر الشاي I'm incorporating my learnings Go for it All four rolling Ready? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Welcome to episode 70, season 3 of the Mo Show podcast. Before we get started, I want to take a second to thank our viewers, the National Museum of Saudi Arabia located here in Riyadh. Today truly marks a historic day for me as a Saudi citizen and as a podcaster. Today, I would like to introduce to you someone who year after year continues to contribute and to serve our country, both home and abroad. She's broken barriers changed stereotypes and altered perceptions of how both our country and region is being represented. On a personal level, my admiration to you is immeasurable. I've referenced you on many episodes gone by and will continue to do so in episodes to come if you're okay with that. It is my biggest honor to put together the following words. Please join me in welcoming Sahbat al-Sumu al-Malaki al-Amira Rima bin Bandar al-Saud, Safirat al-Mamlaka al-Arabiya al-Saudiya lil-Wulayat al-Muttahid al-Amerikiya. And in English, Her Royal Highness Princess Rima bin Bandar al Saud, the ambassador, Saudi Arabia's ambassador to the United States of America. Hello. Hi. Thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you so much for making time for me. Uh, thank you so much for responding to me when I reached out and uh, for taking an hour or two out of your day uh, in coming on the show. It's, uh, it's an opportunity and something I will never forget. Likewise, honestly, I'm a big fan of your show and I've, I couldn't imagine anywhere I'd rather be right now. So thank you. You have no idea what that means to me. So thank you, thank Princess Rima. Okay, let's get started. Tell me. Today, as you can see, I I've never been to this uh, museum before. And the first time I came to inspect this space was a week ago. And I was like, wow, where has this place been all my life? Mm -hmm. You know, we have a chance to see the history of the country, the journey of the land. Your Royal Highness, you made history on February 23rd, 2019, by becoming Saudi Arabia's first ambassador. Can you take us back to that day and tell us how you felt? It was honestly one of the most emotional days of my life. Um, and I say this, it was either equal or more emotional than when I had both my children, because it was a moment that I knew my life was going to completely change. There's, there's no coming back from the step that we're taking forward on so many levels, not just for, for female inclusion and representation, but that the statement that His Majesty King Salman was making and the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman were making by choosing a woman to represent this nation to the United States of America. I, I was definitely very, very emotional. And it, um, I still get emotional when I think about it, because I still, I know I'm doing my job. I know I live in America, but when I close my eyes, I think of myself as the little girl who had dreams and aspirations that I can't imagine what she thought then about what could be today. It's just, it's so the opposite. And it's, I, I get overwhelmed. I can see. Was it a dream of yours one day? No. <laughs> to be our ambassador? No. Um, to work with and represent and do for my nation, yes. In fact, it's it's humbling for me that we're actually in the National Museum because this was my dream. My mother had the largest collection of material culture uh, of the GCC area and specifically the Middle East. And my dream was to study, to work, to represent my nation through culture and through its material culture, which is essentially what we wear, what we use to live, what we built around us. And I studied museum studies. I worked with my mother's collection through the Field Museum. I, I interned at the Institut de Monde Arabe in, in, in Paris, at the um, uh, Sackler Gallery of Art in DC to prepare myself for this career once we came home. And at that time, women couldn't work within the museum organization. And it was the moment that pivoted my life that like many young women in this country, I had a dream and I had to think, okay, I have skills, but I don't have the opportunity to use the skills I've, I've harnessed. What do I do now? And like many young women, 
I made the pivot to that next chapter of my career. And so I love this museum. I love the heritage it represents. I love the fact that we're sitting in this environment that represents our past, but we're sitting in such a modern context talking about our future. Totally. It's, it's, it's inspiring for me. Yeah. It's, I mean, I had two or three options and I, and I shared a couple with them, uh, with, with your team. And when I saw this, I was like, it's a slash of Al Ula with Dir'iyah. Yeah. I just knew it when I saw this it. This is it. Yeah. Throughout your career, yeah. you were involved in a multitude of industries, mm -hmm. fashion, business, sports, mm -hmm. contributing towards women empowerment initiatives in, in all segments. Looking back, how do you reflect on your journey before you took on your role in government? So it, when you look at it, it sounds very bizarre because none of them seem to make sense with each other unless you go one level down and you recognize the work that I have been doing has been in service to, for, or with women. Um, in Yabrin, year 2000, we founded a ladies' uh, fitness center um, at a time when women couldn't have a license for a fitness center. We were a mashgal, mm -hmm. uh, a seamstress shop. That was our license. We couldn't own the shop in our name or the center in our name. It was in my cousin Saud's name. Uh, Saud and Abdurrahman, my, my two partners, Nawful Bandari. We decided to do it because we knew we wanted to provide a service for women. We knew there were obstacles. So we said, if there's an obstacle and we want to do it, how do we overcome the obstacle to do? Again, same journey every woman had here when she had the dream and the will, but she faced a wall and didn't know how to go through it. We just said, okay, we could either hit or figure out the way around. And we did. Um, and that obstacle today doesn't exist. That, that blows my mind. Um, I go from there going into retail. It was storytelling, the same as museums, storytelling. You're guiding your customer through a journey. You're, you're encouraging them to have certain behaviors and actions, which is skills I learned uh, when I studied museum studies, except instead of learning, it was merchandise and it was movement of product rather than movement of thought. But all of these things, these steps across my career gave me access to women and not just women we were servicing, but women we were employing. And that was the turning point for me, to be honest with you. Um, and that's how I, I created Al Khair, which was a social enterprise on female financial literacy. Why? Because in 2011, I got divorced. I was a young lady, I think well-educated, but I wasn't educated on my personal financial literacy. So I was so lucky that when I left my husband's home, I moved back to my parents' home and my lifestyle didn't change because I had people that were comfortable to welcome me home. And I hadn't thought about savings. I hadn't thought about my future. I hadn't thought about kids schooling. What does this mean? And I was very fortunate to have a kind ex-husband who shared these responsibilities with me. But as I saw the women that were working in our store, they did not have the same opportunity. They didn't have the same access. They didn't have the same comfort in the various life situations they had, whether they were getting divorced or not, or staying in a marriage that maybe they didn't want to be in because they were scared of what the other chapter of life might bring, or whether they were women that just didn't feel supported in their family home. And I thought I could, spend the next five years of my life working in retail, selling things, or I could take a step back and work with those women and say, how can I help you? How can I help you lift yourself up, learn the language of savings, learn the language of employability, learn the language of equity, because it's better for you. You will be a better citizen, a better sister, a better mother, a better daughter, a better wife, better employee. If you feel stable and safe in yourself, in the same way that I had the privilege to feel stable and safe. So we created a curriculum called Elf Darb, and we worked with over 3,000 women across multiple sectors, teaching them self-sufficiency. Who are you? What do you aspire to? Who is in your network and circle that will help you get there? Financially, what is a need? What is an obligation? What's a want? Because things you just, you want, you don't need them. You just want them. How can I help you manage what you want and get there? but not at the expense of what you need, food, shelter, home, and what you're obliged to do, pay rent, pay bills, pay invoices. Um, and balancing that triangle is a skill set that I feel is critical, not just for women, but also for men. We assume these poor men that we marry, these men that are in the, in the private sector or in government sector have these skills too. They don't, who taught them? Nobody. So don't blame the husband who doesn't know what financial management is. Nobody told him. 
Don't blame your brother. He doesn't know. We have a responsibility to learn, to educate. And if we know, we should teach. And so that, that was what I wanted, to give women these skills so they could take them and, and uh, spread them amongst their family unit, spread it amongst their friends, and it becomes uh, a mindset. Yeah. And so that, that really is what connected me then into the Ministry of Sports uh, because I was working with women, accessing women, engaging with women, and also supporting the Zahra Breast Cancer Association. We did a number of activities around uh, Guinness World Records. And in 2015, we broke a Guinness record. Um, we had over 13,000 women in attendance at Princess Noura University, and over 9,000 actually physically standing in a ribbon uh, to raise awareness for breast cancer. And we had a touch point engagement with Wazara Tirriyalda asking if we could use their premises. And at that time in 2015, they said, you know, women don't enter stadiums. So it will be very difficult for us to allow you to host an event in a space that women don't come to. Um, and I said, okay, well, how, how do we do this then? They said, Endik Jam at Noura, it's the biggest space that you could possibly host this in. We hosted our event December, I think it was 10 or 12. 2015, January 2016, Lemir Abdullah bin Saad called me and said, Reem, I need you to come to my office. And I was like, uh oh, <laughs> I've done something. Um, he's going to tell me off. And um, Abdullah is a really, really good friend, as is his wife and his whole family. They're just exceptional humans. And he called me into his office and he said, Rima, you seem to have access to women. I said, yes. He said, I want to offer you the opportunity to make change for the women of this country through this organization that we are in. And um, I remember at the time I was embarrassed by this, but today I'm not. While I was speaking to him, all I could feel was tears coming out of my eyes. And I was trying to be mature about it and you know, just kind of tap it away, but I couldn't stop because as he was speaking to me, I knew two things. A, I knew I was going to say yes. And B, I knew that if my vision and mission of my life was to create access for, to opportunity for women, I was going to immediately scale from having access to three, 400 women a year to 11 million who are the women of this country. And that would have taken me 10, 20 years to work towards. And this man was sitting in front of me, offering me that opportunity. And that came because he was a part of this initiative, the NTP, the Nationally Transformative Projects that Crown Prince Mohammed was leading. And at that time, it was a very quiet. They'd all gotten together and said, based on His Highness's direction, we need to, we need to start including women. And so Prince Abdullah was looking for someone that could help him fulfill that role. And he asked me to do it. And it was one of the most emotional moments of my life. I would imagine that when you walk in public or at an event, the women probably don't leave you alone. Like you need more security from women than anyone else because of what you've done for them. Uh, they're probably in tears when they see you because you're no longer a sign of hope. You're a sign of what you've done for them. I remember 2016, 2015, I've been around long enough to know that, yeah, women come to think of it, they weren't allowed into stadiums. And now it's not even something we discuss. So I'll tell you something. Um, it humbles me. It it moves me. It 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 it's lovely, honestly, to see the reaction young women have. But I have to remind them: you see me, you're not seeing the people mm. and the generations of women that led to this point. Um, whether it was Efatithneya and my grandmother, where the women's school, whether it was Tiktora Thraya Al Abed. Sarah Al Faisal, Mouli bint Khalid, um, through Jamiat Al Nahda, here in Riyadh, whether it was Dr. Alam Al Suleiman, through the Chamber of Commerce, Dr. Basma Al Amir, with all of her advocacy through Khadija, Merkaz Khadija bint Khwalid, uh, Lina Al Maina, from Majlis Al Shura, um, women whose names I could spend hours and days talking about are the women that allowed me to have the confidence and to see and measure impact of, of what could be done and what should be done. And I have to keep reminding people, we have a visionary leader, Lamir Mohammed bin Salman, who looked around and said, this cannot be. 
And he created the framework and the infrastructure that said, we can and we will do better. Not just we can, we can is just let's think about it. We will Excellent. do better. So he has allowed us and enabled us and encouraged us and challenged us to keep delivering. So please know, and this is what I want to tell every young woman, I am you and you are me, but we together exist because of every single woman before us that walked this path with grace and dignity in the face of obstacles, whether they were societal or physical. And we are all an engine that is empowered by Lemir Muhammad bin Salman, a visionary man who, while he doesn't see every single one of you, he feels responsible for every single one of you. And he thinks about every single one of you and the opportunity you could have. And he's enabled and activated all of us that you see to help deliver this for you. And you see today. And you see it today. You, you see al thamara. you see you the see fruits it? of the labor. It's unbelievable. Yeah. We it's, could actually have a podcast alone just about just the vision that. and what he's done. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Every time I meet with him, he challenges us to do more. And it's it's um, it's um, unfathomable that with everything we've reached, he sees more that oh. can be done. And that's a service to this nation. Yeah. You know. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. We're so lucky. We're so really, lucky. really, we are. I wanted to talk about your father, His Royal Highness Prince Bandar bin Sultan Al Saud, mm -hmm. served in DC for many, many years. Mm -hmm. I think I read somewhere that you even occupy his office, the same one he served in yes, today. Sir. How do you describe him? There's two parts to my father. There's the personal side and there's the public side. The public side is the diplomat, the communicator, the connector, this dynamic human being that's visionary with foresight. And then the personal part is, this is the funniest man you'll ever meet in your life. He is so charming. He is so witty. His stories are phenomenal. His life experience, he brings it down to human level. And he's a teacher. He teaches me. He teaches my brothers and sisters. He teaches my children life lessons every time we're with him, where it will begin as a comment about what's on the news and it goes back into the history of the world to moments of life he's experienced. And it all comes back to something he's observed in one of our lives and a lesson he wants to give us without saying, friend, you may need to pause. He's just giving it to you gently to say, in what I have observed in the world. And while he's telling you the story, you are both laughing, you're crying, you're emotional. And he does it in such a magical way. He is someone I, Every child is proud of their father. Most children, I should say, are. Um, and we've had to share him with the world, but the moments we had to ourselves are things I will never forget. Do you get your humbleness from him? Oh my. Um, that was not in my notes, by the way. I think there's nothing uglier in the world than arrogance. So anything you can do to keep yourself away from that is a good thing. Um, another very prominent figure in your life, Allah Hamu Prince Saud Al Faisal, yes. direct uncle to you, 40 years as foreign minister. Yes. Anyone in politics in the world in any country knows of him. What kind of impact has he had on your life? Anybody who knows him or saw him knows he was one of the most elegant human beings. And he handled some of the most difficult world situations on a public scale with poise and dignity, with measured words. And um, it's how he measured his words as a skill set that I tried to take. From my father, I tried to take the warmth and the connectivity because I saw the impact of how he communicated with people and how it could disarm someone when you're just a normal human being. Just be, just be a human because we all have difficult lives. We're all dealing with things. Just have a human conversation. You'll get your father. But with my uncle, it was in that moment, that finite moment, be brief, be thoughtful, and be direct. And that's what I learned from him. And you carry it throughout your day to day. I try to, I try to. Yeah. Amazing. Ajina muhabbara bshabab. Gawamaha khafif uhash. Uta'amaha wala arwa.
you being chosen, I want to go back. I'm not done talking about you being chosen as our first female ambassador to the U.S. How do you feel that in and of itself perhaps changed the landscape for females who have a dream of following in your footsteps one day? So there's a saying, you cannot be what you cannot see. We've had women in the foreign ministry, by the way, far before I came along. Um, but to be appointed to a position that's so visible and so public makes every young girl in the farthest corner of this country say, that could be me. And it promotes dreams and it inspires young women to take that path and think, what do I need to do to get there? Because I see it on Twitter, I see it on Instagram, I get questions all the time from young ladies. What can I do to be you? Well, A, you can't be me. I can't be you, you can't be me. We are each born into different lives, different paths. But what you can emulate is how to get to this role is self-confidence, be inquisitive, be curious, learn, 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 try and fail a million times um, and keep pushing because this may be your stated dream in the same way I thought working in this museum was my stated dream, but it was the journey to getting here that took me on this magical path that I ended in completely the opposite direction, but I'm still storytelling because the skills necessary in both. I'm still in my heritage and communicating it just in a different way. And I landed somewhere that I had to have the flexibility to release myself to change my path. Mm -hmm. And my advice to young women is to never be stubborn and pit themselves against their own expectation. If I pit myself against my own expectation today, I'd be a failure. Even though I would say I have a successful career, I failed at what my actual initial ambition was, which was to work in this museum. But you can't qualify me as a failure. I failed at this because the situation around me did not allow my success in this. So I could either sit home and go, I'm done. I'm done. This is it. What am I going to do with myself? Or I can go, I have skills. How can I try to manage this? Can I pivot? It's not exactly what I want. Let me try here while I try to get there and work my way through it. So don't be fixed on what you think this job is that you want. Understand that the journey is bigger than yourself, but just don't give up. But be flexible enough to recognize the thing you started with may not be where you end with. And that flexibility um, is what teaches you humility and it teaches you acceptance. Um, but it comes with frustration, it comes with tears, and it comes with um, angst. But those are feelings you have to go through no matter what, because they're part of the challenge of life. And I, I just want to underscore the fact that you are speaking from personal experience. Yes. You adjusted, you pivoted until something that you thought was going to be your destiny, your right. passion. You carried that because they're not too disconnected. I mean, wanting to you know, be in an environment like this to where you are today. They're not similar, but they're not too disconnected. True. It's, uh, it's profound, really. It's shocking. And you have to take a couple of steps back to look at it and go, I see. Oh, I see. OK. It all came full circle. It did. Catmosphere. Yes. Very interesting. I, um, in this episode, I did a bit of research and Catmosphere came up a few times. Mm -hmm. Something you spoke at last year's Saudi Green Initiative. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about the initiative? So the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia uh, is working with an organization called Panthera, which is a global organization, and they're helping us to repatriate the Arabian leopard. Unfortunately, because of life and world circumstances, these beautiful creatures are dwindling in numbers. Um, over expansion into the area they live, over grazing, uh, desertification, natural causes. And the kingdom has made a concerted effort to conserve a large portion, almost 30% of this land mass that we're on, to bring back the natural environment, whether it's through the trees and the shrubberies, the smaller animals, all the way through to this beautifully majestic Arabian leopard. And the Royal Commission of Lula uh, has been commissioned with this project. Uh, it's actually been historically all across the West Coast. There have been some beautiful, beautiful initiatives. Um, and I was speaking with Prince Badr and with Thomas Kaplan, who founded Panthera. And we said, how do we elevate the status of the work that we are doing and connect it 
to the story that the rest of the world has. Why should anyone in the world care about the Arabian leopard? We should, but why should they? So we said, I said, give me a minute. Let me go and think about this. And the original idea, by the way, to show you why you have to pivot uh, was because of my experience in retail, I thought we should reach out to the fashion community and say, you lovely people have been using the cheetah print, the leopard print, the tiger print for free. And these animals can't call you and say, pay me my royalty, sure. you're using my likeness. Elvis Presley and Marilyn Monroe, even though they're dead, have foundations that collect money every single time someone uses their image, their voice. And I thought someone needs to advocate for these animals, so why don't we do it? So we thought to reach out to them and create these fashion shows. That's why it was a play on words, the catwalk. Catwalk, yeah. And then COVID hit and we're like, oh my God, the world has stopped, what are we going to do now? But what was so interesting to me when the world stopped was we, as human beings began to experience what we have done to all of these animals, to the lions, the leopards, the cheetahs, the pumas, the jaguars, these magnificent creatures have been isolated from their communities. They've been isolated from their resources. They have been fixed into small spaces. They feel threatened. They feel scared. They don't know what's happening. That's exactly what happened to all of us yeah. during COVID our basic life changed and we don't know why we had no control. You begin to get helpless, sense of helplessness. Many people went into depression. I was like, oh, how interesting. God just said, lovely friends, let me let you feel what you've done to every other living creature on this earth. The irony. The irony. So I said, what would it look like if we pivoted? And we were told, where is it safe for us to go outside? safe for us to go outside, to go walk, breathe the fresh air, be in nature. We started talking about the biodiversity of the world and the balances, and I was like, great, we are these cats right now. So what if rather than walking on a catwalk in fashion, what if we actually came back to a human sensibility and encourage people to walk on behalf of these cats, just seven kilometers outside and be reconnected with nature, your community, your family, your friends, and create new paths that we engage in. And while you're at it, recognize how beautiful this is. Recognize your role as the individual in this environment. And what we saw last year was people started planting trees. People started cleaning up trash. Kids did activities. The community themselves, my simple ask was, on this day, at any time, walk anywhere. Walk up and down your stairs, walk outside, take a friend, pick which cat you're walking for. This community in this country mobilized every city. It was unbelievable. And I looked at it and I was like, we care. And what was even more magical was in 2017, when I was working at the Ministry of Sports, it was so difficult to get people, men, women, and children to walk in the same place and organize in the same place. And we, as the Ministry of Sports and the Sports for All, at that time it was called Mass Participation Federation, had to organize events and invite people in. Whereas for Catwalk last year, people self-organized and came out in the thousands, 13,000 people. We worked with Abdullah bin Saeed, who's honestly, he's a magician. He works at Mumbra. And I just called and said, I'd love your support on this. Um, he organized across the country, specified areas through the Ministry of Municipalities. I contacted the governors of each region and they all said, Tem? And they mobilized their offices to create the spaces for people to walk and just make sure that it was safe and you know that the first aid and the, the ambulances in case somebody needed it, you know, all the things you need to make an event safe for people. And I'm so profoundly grateful to them for last year that this year we have so many ministries supporting because they see the value of physical activity, community engagement, mobilization of people for a cause. And the cause is how do we educate our young people on the value of the natural environment, recognize their place in it, and make them fall in love with this creature, this magnificent, beautiful creature. And so we've got educational uh, components that we've been pushing out through our social media. We have this year uh, public sector and private sector partners. We have this amazing organization who you should probably talk to, Mukatafa. They reached out to us, uh, Prince Walid, who runs it and said, you know, last year you guys did a really nice job, but you didn't communicate with the private sector. And I said, no, I know, because we didn't think it would be this big. And I said, I don't know how to reach every single one. He said, let me do it for you. And he connected us to 90 companies across this country and the Middle East 
and they've stepped up. And what we've realized is people want to do good. You just need to present them how and what. And um, we hope what we've created is this network of the coalition of the willing who understand that the next generation will not thank us for the damage that we've done to this environment. And we all want to do our part. And we all want to be a part of this community and we all want to give. And there's no cost to participate in the catwalk. What we hope to do is to inspire the next generation of youth to be a part of the conservation and environmental movement, uh, that businesses to be more conscious of their contribution and people to be more aware of their environment and to place the Arabian leopard with the six other magnificent, beautiful creatures of the world. I'm, I'm so proud of you. It, it really is one of the most beautiful initiatives I've, 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 I've ever come across, honestly. Um, you know, it's it's something that I can tell is a priority to you in a world where it, it, it isn't to many. And and here here you are creating a movement, getting people to buy in. And on the subject of buying in and movement, like with the integration of women into society, owning businesses, working, driving. I'm so proud. It gets me every time I see a lady driving. I'm, like, I'm so happy that my five-year-old Adam gets to grow up in a country where mama can drive, where his aunties can drive, where it's similar to the rest of the world. And it happened seamlessly. Mm -hmm. Does it get you on a, like when you're driving, when you see women and their involvement, I mean, does it get old to you? It never gets old. It never, never, never gets old. I get emotional every time I walk out the door of my home here. I get emotional every time I pick up my phone and there's this uh, two, uh, I guess they're blogs maybe that I follow, Love in Saudi and, and about her. Every time I see what they post about women, it blows my mind. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. it's, it's cool. And in, in such a short period of time. It's good. If someone left Saudi in 2015 and, and decided to come back and, and work here again in 2022, they wouldn't know where to look. I worked in Vision 2030. I worked in the quality of life. I delivered through the Ministry of Sports and I still can't believe it. Any, it's, it's like a cook who cooks something goes, oh my God, it's actually good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's good, it's good, you know. <laughs> top down, Princess Rima, when it comes from the top down, you see. Correct, and um, here's the beauty of the top. The top, specifically His Highness, looks at something and says, is it working? If it's working, keep going. But he'll challenge you. you. Go, I don't think it's working. Show me how we can do this better. So he allows you to pivot. He allows you to represent. Um, he allows you to change and shift because the end goal is what's important. Yeah. How we get there has to be the right way. So if what we're doing is not working, he'll say, Paul Hans, rethink this, come back to me. You've got 30 days, 60 days, come back to me and show me how we should do better. And I find that a phenomenal sense of leadership because some people come to me and they say, ah, Rima, you guys have shifted so many times, this project, that project, this KPI, that KPI. I'm like, really? Would you rather we keep walking straight into the wall when we know it's not working? Or would you like us to take a moment and go, mm, this would work better if we go that way. And so that's what we're gonna do because the goal is what's important, how we get there has to be the best way, not the first way we came up with, the best way. And that might be iteration three, four, or five. And I find that kind of confidence in leadership to allow us to pivot, phenomenal. Yeah, it's actually a great lesson on, on leadership in any capacity. The word flexibility is, is coming to mind. Mm -hmm. Be flexible in, in your leadership. Correct. Um, flexible, but not complacent. Correct, yeah. yeah. Not, eh, it didn't work. Let me try another way. No, 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 no. I love that. Figure it out. If this plan didn't work, come up with a new plan. Not, it's not a, a crapshoot where it's mm -hmm. my luck. No, there's no luck here. This is serious study. And why are we pivoting? If I do it this way or that way, why is one better than the other? You know, not just from a cost point of view or a cost savings. Really practically, why is A better than B? And why should I shift? Mm, convince me. Convince yeah. me. Yeah. Totally. You mentioned briefly, and, I, and I, it was actually in, in, in my notes, and I want to maybe go into it a little bit more detail. Al-Khair, 
Yeah. Um, you've been a big part of, of that agenda and, and, and the community. Uh, it supports financial self-sufficiency. Uh, when I was putting together this question, you know what came to mind? Mm -hmm. What came to mind are new widows who have just uh, lost their husbands and they enter a world where they have to handle the finances of the family and they're almost like a deer in the headlights. Yeah. I was like, you know, this project uh, or initiative that teaches people how to uh, benefit from uh, financial literacy uh, puts them in a position where they are able to run the finances uh, of the house. Mm -hmm. um, is, is it something that um, continues to grow? More people are signing up and, and benefiting from it. Can you just talk a little bit about it? So I have to explain Al Khair and then I'm going to give you a hint, which I can't talk about today, okay. but we'll be able to talk about in January. So I founded Al Khair in 2013 and I actually left uh, working at uh, Alpha International, which is the retail company, in order to really deep dive uh, into it. We had three years of programming and when I was hired into the Ministry of Sports, I had to stop all business, all commercial activity. So it went on pause, but as an initiative, it was taken on by an entity called Tenween. So they are still teaching the curriculum. Vision 2030, again, we touched on it. Mashallah, Aleki, like you were talking about everything that I wanted to ask, but it just came naturally from you. Vision 2030, eight years till 2030. Mm -hmm. Where do we stand today and what challenges do you see ahead for us? We're in such a good place. We're in such a good place because the momentum of the physical infrastructure that needs to be built has already started. Uh, and we're really, you can see the physical infrastructure. Um, on the human scale, the amount of kids that have gone out on these scholarships for these new jobs that will be necessary as 2030 physical infrastructure finishes and the jobs must be implemented and populated, that's on the rise. And it's such an interesting parallel the human development with the physical development of the country. Um, we're in a very good place. And what's so exciting for me is that the timeline is like lock and step. And um, my, my question, my question to this next generation is, if you're this generation of 2030, how are you going to inspire the generation post 2030 to have the same drive you have because you're a part of, you're seeing it coming, you know it's coming. We hope we've energized you, but we'll buy what we're building and creating for you with you. You have a responsibility to hand over that energy to that next generation. So they're not complacent because they don't know the challenges my generation went through to inspire what's happening now because we went through the generation that our parents went through to say, ah, this could be better. This could be better. Why, why aren't we doing better? Um, and so they have a responsibility. I just want to remind them. Mm -hmm. It's not over yeah. in 2030. Yeah, it, it is certainly a responsibility. Mm -hmm. You're right, because they don't know the uh, before and after. Correct. Yeah. With FII coming to an end yesterday, yes. any, any highlights uh, you can share? Anything catch your eye? The quality of conversation was outstanding. The diversity of the people in the room was outstanding. And I think it is a real shining of example that the rest of the world who may have questioned the viability and the durability of Vision 2030 and what His Highness has architected. This was the first time I heard them say, we kept waiting for, for you guys not to fail, but to say, eh, we're scaling back. Maybe it's not really happening. Or we'd come and go, we told you so. We told you you couldn't do it all. But this is the year they go, oh my God, we see it. It's real. You've done it. We see it rising and we want to be a part of it. And that for me was magical to hear that they actually really, it was lip service before, it's real now. And that's exciting for me. So you really like deep down, you must have like internally celebrated. Completely. Said, yeah, Half of me you. wants to high five everyone. The other <laughs> half was like, told you so. Yeah. <laughs> told you <laughs> you didn't believe me but i told you yeah 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 we believed on a local level mm -hmm. the region then believed one of the one of the surprising factors of my podcast within the first six months my biggest viewers were egypt iraq lebanon our neighboring countries 
no one's going to be more interested in you than your neighbor. They want, they really want to know what's happening next door. The first time I had a, a female guest, Raham mm Harrag, -hmm. they're like, what? A, a male and a female can be in a studio alone? Just so you know the stereotypes they had of us. Yeah. And, um, and now I'm seeing the numbers of the US, UK, Australia climb. Fantastic. And they are seeing that Saudi Arabia is not what it once was. True. Which leads me um, to my next question, pretty much. Did you want to reflect on something? I did. I, I did because, you know, I have had just the most wonderful relationships with people from all of the countries you've mentioned that have worked here and worked here for 20, 30 years. They really helped us build our nation. They worked with us. They worked for us. They worked around us. And I hope they know how grateful we are for their friendship, for their time, for their service, and how excited we are to welcome them back to this country, to collaborate, to dream, to cross-pollinate, Saudi to Egypt, Egypt to Saudi, Saudi to Iraq, Iraq to Saudi. Um, and that brings me pride. And we should be proud of our brotherly relations and sisterly relations and what we learned from each other and um, I hope that the collective Arab today thrives together. Yeah, we all share this knack for hospitality. Correct. It's almost like we compete with one another. Yes, and we should. How lovely is it that we compete to be more gracious and more generous? <laughs> yeah. That's a world I want to live in. Me too. <laughs> you know, my food's better than your food. No, yours is better than mine. I'm like, you know what? Yeah. I'll taste it all. Yeah. I'm good. Sit down. Let me cook for you. Let me cook. <laughs> no, don't let me cook. <laughs> It will not be good if for anyone if I cook. <laughs> I think you're too harsh on yourself. Oh, no, no. Trust me. Ask my kids. I found out yesterday at midnight mm -hmm. that the first U.S. embassy in Saudi was in Jeddah, my city. Oh, how interesting. 1944, 78 years ago. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. What do the U.S.-Saudi relations that are 78 years old mean to you as an ambassador and how would you say we're driven forward through this relationship? So I feel so old because I'm half the age of the relationship. And I lived 23 years of that relationship with my father and three years on my own in this relationship. Two years where my uncle was our ambassador um, and uh, my uncle Turki Faisal. And I have a very personal sense of ownership of this relationship because I grew up in it. And I can't tell you, you read the politics and the headlines in the same way Americans read the politics and the headlines. But America's big and America's beautiful and they're kind, good people. In the same way, when you get past a headline, Saudi's big and it's beautiful and it's majestic and our people are fabulous and our people have different identities where their cultural roots come from our mountains are different than the city the city is different than the coastal community the east coast and the west coast it's these multiple flavors of the kingdom of saudi arabia that i work very hard for the regions of the united states to understand we are also bigger than our capital our energy capital and our faith capital we are bigger than that in the same way that the United States is bigger than Washington, D.C., New York, Florida, Texas, and California. The middle of America are some of the most gracious people you'll ever meet. And I feel compelled to keep traveling across the states, to keep talking to the different cities and states and shine a light on who we are to them. But I also feel obligated to share, shed a light for Saudis on what's happening there. So whenever I travel state to state, I meet as many people, I document as much as I can from their women's centers to their governor's office, to the world affairs, to the business community, because what I'm trying to highlight also for Saudis is come to this part of America, work with this part of America. It's ready for you. And inviting those people from America to come here and see it because we're ready for them. Um, I would really encourage both citizens Leave the politics for the politicians, but the people, the heart of nations, that's people to people. Yeah. The more you know each other, the better the world is. We have a lot in common. So much. I've lived, I've been going to San Diego since 86, I was three mm -hmm. years old. I went to school in Boston. I mean, 
I know the US very well yeah. and I've never seen anything bad from them. I was there in September 11th. My name is Mohammed Islam from Saudi Arabia. There you go. And the way like people were treating me, are you okay? Are you comfortable? Are yes. you good? I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. Yeah. Was... In the same way, if we find a stranger here, we'll guide them, we'll take them where they need to go, we'll feed them. It's the same. Yeah. It is. Do you manage to go to like the middle part, like New Orleans? I haven't been to New Orleans yet. Good, I, good food there, I hear. I want to. I am so told. I, I'm. I'm going. I've been to Wyoming. I've been to Detroit, Michigan. I've been to uh, Idaho. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It really I've is. been to Utah. Utah. It's magic. Yeah. It's really magic. It truly is. Uh, Utah and Arizona, in some spaces, you could be in Alola. <laughs> yes, you're right. It does look like it. The, the Red Rocks, Red Rocks. And, and the Zion Park, it's, ma- it's, it's unbelievable. It really is. It's really unbelievable. One of my dreams was doing a New York, LA road trip. The Route 66? Actually, east to west. Okay. I want to do like a full three day. I did Boston, Miami. Okay. 15 years ago. I want to do cross country. I want to get to know I won't judge you for that. Mid- Boston to Miami. <laughs> it's awful, I know. <laughs> Cut that out. I want to go through the heart land of America you because should. really it's uh, it's just, as you said, magical, truly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In my travels, um, the word drive, is push, not drive, mm-hmm. uh, always springs to mind. Like I've had 69 guests before you. You're my 70th drive. I, I tend to ask him, you know, what's your drive? What what got you to where you are today? Princess Seema, what what's your drive deep down that got you to where you are today? I recognize I have privilege. I recognize I was born into privilege. And I see the difference between what my privilege gives me and the state of others. And, you know, I said this at a conference I was at before, I have a conscience. So my conscience drives me to try to give the opportunity to others who may not have had the privilege I have had. And that drives me. That is so beautifully said. Wow, goosebumps. I have a few, let's not say personal, but questions that can show the audience who Princess Rima is the human <laughs> away from the day to day life. Uh, I can imagine some days in DC are super busy, 17, 18 hours, super, super duper busy. After one of those really busy days, how do you unwind or de-stress? Are, are we talking a movie with some popcorn? The biggest gift you can give yourself is the gift of sleep. Because it recharges your mind, it relaxes your body, and it gives you a moment to just recompose. And sometimes, because the day is so full of input, media is another round of input, and it doesn't let you switch off. Um, and I will tell you, with so much happening, sometimes I just need to be quiet. I just need to sit and be quiet because I have to A, reflect on what just happened, whether it's positive, negative, or it's just things that need to get done. And I need to just calm down. I need to, I need to bring the energy down because if I'm not calm, I'm walking into an office where people will either calm down because I'm calm or be agitated because I'm agitated. I, re- I recognize my energetic impact on the team. So I have to come back in calm the next morning so we can get our job done. But if it's quiet time, I honestly, I am blessed to live in a very beautiful area it's in Virginia. The outdoors are gorgeous. Um, so to be able to walk out in Great Falls and those different areas is wonderful. Or just, um, I'll tell you my biggest challenge there is I lived in the States with my parents, my children, my brothers and sisters, and this iteration of life, I'm on my own. My kids are in college, my family isn't there. Many of my friends left. And so it's about new beginnings, new starts, reconnecting with the few people that are still there. Um, so it's not it's not like here, where it's Thursday night, yalla, let's, let's go have dinner, let's go. I have to sit and think, okay, what do I do today? <laughs> You know, Um, and so I think learning to also be quiet with yourself and comfortable with yourself and be comfortable in the quiet times is also important. It's a superpower to enjoy time alone. Do you you enjoy time alone? I do. 
I do. Because I meet so many people all day long. It's like, oh my God, today, can, can today just be quiet? Me time. Just me. Are you more of a movie or a book person? Okay. I like books. I like movies. I typically don't like movies of books I've read. You're right. It should be either or, right? Because I've imagined a world. And so now I'm watching someone else's imagination. Yeah. So I'd rather have not read the book of the movie or only read the book and not like it. I get it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Typically when I watch a movie, if I'm like, mm, I don't really like that, I would then find that it was a novel that Correct. flipped. And I'm like, oh yeah, it was a book that. Yes. Any favorite movies? It's childish. Take a few seconds. No, no. My favorite movie is The Princess Bride. The Princess Bride. Mm -hmm. Carrie Elwes, As You Wish. Yes. What are you reading these days? So can I tell you something terrible? I used to read all the time. I had a book in my hand, in my bag. I had a book in my car. I had a book at home. I'd sometimes read two, three books at the same time. But with this job, my brain is fried. Uh, it's fried. It's been three years that I haven't picked up a book that I've been able to focus on and read because when I read, I get so immersed in what I'm doing. Um, and if I could say there's a downside to this job is there's so much information coming your way and things you need to process that when I am quiet, I will have read so much during the day that I just want to close my eyes and give it a break. And so it hurts me to say I have not really read a book since I landed in Washington, D.C. until today. And that's not okay. It's not terrible either. It makes sense. You're overwhelmed with everything that's on your plate. Yes. But whenever you have a minute, you just want to do nothing. But I have a library of books that I have been buying and storing mm. for when I retire to sit by the beach and read a book a day. <laughs> you have a plan, so. I have a plan. It's good. <laughs> I have focus. I have drive. <laughs> you do indeed. I'm going to the beach. <laughs> What puts you in a good mood? Uh, my kids put me in a good mood when they're behaving. Uh, my family, my friends put me in a good mood. Um, music puts me in a good mood. Sunshine puts me in a good mood. I am not a winter child. I am grateful and thankful for the rain. It doesn't put me in a good mood. Only because I grew up in Washington, DC. So if it was a rainy day as a kid, it meant we're not playing outside. <laughs> So I have PTSD from being stuck inside a classroom <laughs> at age seven or eight. So it's raining. I can't go out. <laughs> so. Something that's improved your life so much that you wish you would have done it earlier. So this is where everyone I know is going to fall off their chairs. I started rowing on this machine called Hydro um, about a year and a half ago, and it changed my life. Because even though I worked at the Ministry of Sports, I am not an athlete, nor am I athletic. And the only physical activity I did, to be honest with you, was to not have osteoporosis and not be hunchback. Because I just, that's a physical trauma you cannot come back from once you're older. Um, and so I did the bare minimum. But this rowing takes my mind off of work. I feel physically better, I feel stronger, um, and it's great. Is it like your typical rowing machine? Yes, except for the cycle. It's like the Peloton version of rowing. So there's a screen. Okay. And because you're watching what they're doing and you're listening to what they do, you're, you're immersed. Mm. So you're not thinking of anything. You're not on your phone. Your hands are on the bar. Your eyes are on the screen. And it, you can either do like the boot camp or the upper body, lower body, whatever it is, or the whole body. And 15 minutes is just focused. Wow. And... Um, Yes. And in 15 minutes, you're getting yourself a good workout. An amazing workout. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. I'm going to look into that. Mm -hmm. Because we live in a world where, you know, sometimes we don't have an hour or, or, or yes. so to work out. So these 15, 20 minute high intensity could it's be important. all you need. Uh, yeah. yeah. You've been a big part of everything we've seen. We touched, touched on it in the beginning. Uh, the last five years has changed so much. What would you like to see in the next five? like to see us enjoy the fruit of what we've created because we're so fast on the go to keep producing and keep delivering 
I watch some of my colleagues and I say, you've done the most exceptional things that nobody in this world thought was possible. And you did them in five years. Stop and smell the roses. Mm -hmm. Celebrate your success. Recognize your success. Because if you don't, you'll burn out. Um, and I would like to see us widen our scope from just talking about the success of women to the success of all, because we have to keep empowering women and opening the doors and enabling, not at the expense of the young men. Mm -hmm. And what we're giving and pushing for women, we should also be pushing and giving for the young men, because we're all on this together. And um, I, I just, always I'm mindful when someone asks me about championing women, we need to, and we need to do more. Can't leave these guys behind. That an creates an imbalance. So, sorry, it just, it's an interesting point because someone raised it to me about a week ago. He said, I love where we are with women empowerment. It's, you know, changed the whole landscape, but he fears that it might come at a cost of alienating the up and coming men who might not be able to find a good job, support the family. You're right about the imbalance, but yeah, it, it's, it's, it's interesting because I haven't heard it mentioned until this friend of mine mentioned it to me mm -hmm. and just you addressing it right now. I, I appreciate that. Well, I have a son and I have a daughter. Okay. Well, <laughs> and I want them both to thrive and I want them both to have opportunity and I want them both to feel they have access to any opportunity. Um, if they work hard, if they have the drive. Um, so it's, we just need to be mindful um, because otherwise we'll do the opposite end of what we did before, where it was over empowerment of yeah, men yeah. and women felt they had to keep fighting. It, extreme balance, imbalance is not healthy either way. The correct is Maybe. equal opportunity. Um, and you know, something else I'd like us to focus a little bit more on is it's important to have women as the top decision makers and in, in, in your pyramids of your structures or entities and shared decision making. But regardless of whether you have a woman or a man as a decision maker, if your middle management is only women or only men or too low of one gender or the other, the people who are putting together the proposals and the initiatives and the thoughts and the suggestions to the leader, male or female, will never be the correct option because it's not a balanced yeah. kitchen. So you could give a woman the worst advice and she's still a woman leader, but delivering the worst advice. You could give a man leader the worst advice if it's not yeah. reflected of both yeah. mindsets, I would say. So let's focus now. We we're pushing on the top. Let's focus now in the middle, middle. and create the pipeline for both. Yeah, great advice. Two more questions, mm -hmm. taking a lot of your time. Not at all. What would you like to be remembered for, Princess Rima? I'd like to be remembered for opening the door for others and stepping away to allow somebody else to take my place. Because this is not permanent. I am not forever. And I play a role today, but my role will come to an end. And it would be a horrible, horrible thing to think that there's not a wide selection of people you could choose for the things that I'm doing. And I am grateful and humbled to know and see the amounts of phenomenal young men and women that if I disappeared off the earth today could do what I am doing equally as well or better, whether it's in my job as ambassador or it's in any of the initiatives I've worked on or am working on. Um, it is really important to recognize the day you need to make a graceful exit. And I'm very prepared for that. And I am grateful for the opportunities I've had. It just, um, it, it, it resonates so much because I see circumstances when something as simple as knowing when to leave. It could be a dinner party, it could be a position. Not many people have the wherewithal of that. And just for you to touch on it, this isn't mine. This is a team. And if you really believe in what you're trying to build, you want the best person for it. You do. And sometimes the best person is a fresh voice. 
we're not going to let you go without some advice okay. that you can pass on to people who follow you, listen to you, just admire you. Um, what would your message be to those people who just generally look up to you? I first would say thank you because I am very humbled that you would consider me as someone that might be someone you would take advice from. Um, but I would say, remember to be kind to yourself. And sometimes that kindness comes in very different forms. And something that I always, always, always tell people and stress upon is you as an individual, you need to take care of yourself if you want to take care of others. And part of taking care of yourself is this financial literacy. It is understanding what do you need to live today? What is your expectation of your life in the future? And who are you responsible for? Who will you be responsible for? And so the things that you are spending on and enjoying the thrills of today, will you really be thankful for that thing? Five, six years from now, when you look back and you say, I cannot do today what I want because I don't have the means. But had I spent my money better, had I focused and had I saved, had I thought and planned for my future better, what would today look like? What would my children's future look like? What would, would I be able to help my brother who's asking for help today? Can I support my parents? Can I support myself? Please think today is beautiful and wonderful and all of these sayings of live for today too, but think about tomorrow. And you will be more grateful for the savings of tomorrow, if you save them today, than you will be of the splurge of today. Think of yourself in your future. You have prime earning years. So save, save for yourself, save for your future, save for the people you're responsible for. That's my advice to everybody. Your financial self-sufficiency is critical. No one's going to give you anything. Nobody owes you anything when you're older. You can't pass it as, I was young and didn't know. Well, guess what? You know. And you don't want to look back and say, I wish I did. It's almost like you're at the mercy of the decisions you took. Correct. All these years ago. That beautiful bag yeah. will mean nothing six years from now. Yeah. But its value in savings and investment will mean everything. That car means nothing. I love my cars. Um, <laughs> the, the, the quote, uh, do something today that your future self will thank you for. Yes. Springs to mind. Mm -hmm. Speaking of thanking, I want to thank you for um, coming on the show. You had so many options, so many media outlets, but you agreed to this. Um, empowering me, other guys and girls who want to start their own career in podcasting. Um, it means the world to me. I'm one of the people who look up to you. Um, I just, I'm so proud, really, Princess Rima, um, of what you do and for our country, both home and abroad. I learn a lot from, you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't know because it's one way communication. But when I watch you, I try to incorporate the way you deliver your message in that calm way. I don't think you say, um, once. <laughs> no? Try to emulate. Look, this, this is how you're supposed to. Get. So I do watch, I study, and I think I definitely picked up on a few ways of how you operate. <laughs> Thank you. Honestly, for me, it's a real privilege to be here because you are one of the symbols of change. The fact that we have young people doing podcasts and you have men and you have women and you're talking about all sorts of things and subjects that wouldn't have been possible to talk about. Raham Hara climbed mountains and summited Everest and you talk to her. The fact that she could do what she did and you're talking to her and telling her story to a country is inspiring. So you, to me, are a symbol of this, this revival of was, this country and these young people and the voices. So, I, wasn't, I wasn't ready for that. Um, so thank you for letting me be one of the 70 voices you've interviewed. Thank you. So kind, so gracious, as expected, more than my expectations. Thank you. And um, again, just... Thank you, Princess Rima, and, and hopefully we get a chance to talk again soon. Inshallah, maybe post-January. Inshallah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.